thank you um, very much for joining us today. We're beginning our third and final session. This session is going to be moderated by Dr. Radonna Chandler. Dr. Chandler is the NIDA Director of the AIDS Research Program. And in addition, she also directs the Healing Community Study. Welcome, Dr. Chandler. Unfortunately, we can't hear you, Radonna. Now? Yes, thank you. Okay, sorry about that. I was double muted on both my phone and Zoom. Um, thank you all for inviting me to moderate this panel uh, where we're going to talk about current prevention and treatment strategies to sustain recovery for opioid use disorder and polysubstance use disorder, including research opportunities. We've got a really great panel of presenters, and I know that while it's been a long afternoon, you guys are going to really enjoy everything that they have to say. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Judith Sui. Dr. Sui is an associate professor of medicine at the University of Washington. She's an addiction medicine physician providing buprenorphine and hepatitis C treatment in primary care and opioid treatment program settings. She has um, a lot of NIH funded research that focuses on improving the care, delivery and health outcomes for persons with substance use disorders, uh, including an in health intervention to improve adherence to buprenorphine and uh, methamphetamine and a data coordinating center supporting the Rural Opioid Initiative. She's also committed to educating the next generation of addiction science physicians and works on an R25 at the University of Washington. And a fun fact about her is that she is actually, in addition to being a physician and a scientist, a Juilliard trained cellist. So um, Judith, take it away. Thanks so much, Radana, for that introduction. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen here. Just give me a minute. And does that look okay? Yes, it does. Okay, it great. Thanks so much for this um, opportunity to present to you. It's really an honor to present with such esteemed colleagues. These are my financial disclosures, and I do want to acknowledge uh, generous support from NIH and NIDA. And these are the objectives for my talk today, to review trends in methamphetamine use among persons with opioid use disorder, but mainly I'll be presenting research examining association between methamphetamine use and retention and buprenorphine treatment, and also discussing some strategies for improving engagement and retention among patients with opioid use disorder who use methamphetamine. But I'd like to start off with a description of a patient in order to keep us mindful of the overall purpose of this session. And this actually isn't a single patient, but rather a composite of patients that I've seen over the years as a primary care provider who works at an opioid treatment program. So TS is a 55-year-old woman who has a history of a back injury in her 40s, used prescription opioids for years, then heroin, and is now on uh, methadone for opioid use disorder. She was introduced to methadone six months ago by another patient. She says it's everywhere. She now uses a few times a week, either smoking or injecting. She says she uses for focus and energy and sometimes to combat sedation for methadone. She's experienced some recent complications for methamphetamine use requiring recent visits to the emergency department. And she's wondering if someone could prescribe stimulant agonist medications to help her cut back on her methamphetamine use. So for a clinician like me who focuses on treating patients with opioid use disorder based in the Pacific Northwest, the rise in methamphetamine use on the ground has been evident. This study by Ellis published in 2018 described this phenomenon. It looked at patients with opioid use who entered drug treatment programs across the U.S. between 2011 and 2017. And they showed that past month methamphetamine use increased by 83%. And you can see from this figure, the increases have been most dramatic in the Western states as shown in red, but also to a lesser extent in other parts of the country. 
Reports have also emerged that there's an increase in injecting heroin and methamphetamine together, a practice known as goofball. And my colleague, Sarah Glick, here at UW, showed that this combination is associated with particularly high morbidity and risk behaviors, such as overdose and uh, sharing injecting equipment. So given that background of increasing methamphetamine use and related harms among persons with opioid use disorder, we wanted to know the following. Is methamphetamine use associated with worse buprenorphine treatment outcomes like retention? And what happens to methamphetamine use over time among patients who are treated for opioid use disorder with buprenorphine? So I'll be presenting findings from a research paper that we published in 2020 in the Journal of Substance Abuse Treatment. We set out to answer these questions using data from three different SAMHSA-funded clinics in Washington State. The clinics collected data on past 30-day substance use at baseline and at six months for all patients. They also recorded the date of, quote, discharge, which is really a date of considering the patient no longer active in the treatment program as defined by not having a buprenorphine script or visit within 30 days. So I do want to emphasize that discharge here is really an administrative term and doesn't reflect individual providers' decisions whether to prescribe medications. Providers generally did not discontinue buprenorphine prescriptions due to other substance use. As you can see from this slide, at the time of the study, methamphetamines was the second most common substance reported after cannabis. And this slide shows the pattern of methamphetamine use among baseline users. As you can see, most reported infrequent use only one to 10 days per month. And the most common route of administration was smoking followed by intravenous use. Even with that level of infrequent use being the most common, we found that persons who reported any methamphetamine use at baseline were less likely to be retained in buprenorphine treatment over time, as you can see from this Kappa-Meyer curve. After adjusting for demographic factors, we observed that baseline methamphetamine use was associated with more than twice the relative hazards for non-retention, and also that there was a graded risk based on frequency of methamphetamine use. And when we looked at reasons for, quote, discharge, we found that the majority were due to simple loss to follow up, i.e. the patient just never came back to clinic. A minority were due to transfers to other programs or for higher level of care, and a very small minority, 4%, were due to true clinic discharges or other, which includes death and incarceration. We also examined patients' methamphetamine use over time among the 516 who completed both baseline and six-month follow-up surveys. 135 of those were using methamphetamine at baseline, and the majority, 73%, reported they were no longer using at six months. Also, the average number of days of methamphetamine use reported in the past month decreased by six days. There were numerous limitations to the study that I do want to mention. The data came from three programs in Washington State and so may not generalize to other sites and settings. Patterns of methamphetamine use over time were based on self-report in a subsample of patients having follow-up data, which brings up issues of recall bias and sample bias. And finally, the definition of retention that we used was straightforward and was based just on a single treatment episode. But study conclusions were that in the sample, patients who used methamphetamine at baseline appeared less likely to be retained in buprenorphine treatment. However, reductions in methamphetamine use were observed over time. And as such, methamphetamine use should not be a barrier to initiating or maintaining opioid use disorder treatment. In fact, we have a need for low barrier programs that can sex successfully engage patients with opioid use disorder who use stimulants like methamphetamines. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about one such low barrier program. Um, Bu Pathways is a buprenorphine program in Seattle that's co-located in a syringe service program downtown, but there are similar programs in other parts of the country. It provides flexible scheduling with rapid access to medication and care delivered through a harm reduction lens. And it serves patients who are primarily homeless and using stimulants, mainly methamphetamines. So this slide comes from a paper that was recently published, co-authored by uh, Dr. Banta Green and others, and it shows uh, retention among B-Pathways patients who were seen in 2017. 
On the left is the survival uh, curve for a single treatment episode. And as you can see, retention is also a problem as about half patients drop out within the first three months. But to the right, you can see intermittent care episodes color-coded, demonstrating patterns of repeated lapse and re-engagement in treatment for many patients. One thing to note is that this study did not uh, observe declines in stimulant use based on the urine drug tests, um, and that was regardless of patient engagement, which is different from our study. So how do we know whether this movement towards implementing low barrier clinics is having an effect on persons with co-occurring opioid and methamphetamine use? I'll show you some data from a recent study that we published to suggest it has. This study used local data from the CDC's National HIV Behavioral Surveillance System, which every three years is conducted among persons who inject drugs. This study examined the prevalence of past year treatment with methadone or buprenorphine, comparing 2018 with 2015. And we found that there has been a significant increase in both medications, but most particularly for buprenorphine. When we looked at the characteristics of the patients who reported past year use of buprenorphine compared to no treatment, we were somewhat surprised to see the proportion with methamphetamine use was significantly higher among those re receiving buprenorphine. And when we looked at the question asking where patients had been treated, we found that indeed the most common site reported was at a syringe service program. So this provides some indirect evidence for the success of these low barrier programs in engaging uh, persons who inject drugs who use opioids and methamphetamines. Although as I've shown you from prior slides, we still have a ways to go to improve retention. So why is it uh, critically important to keep persons with opioid use disorder who use methamphetamine retained in care? Number one, many will discontinue methamphetamine use over time without any specific interventions. Number two, even if patients don't want to change their use, it is important to offer counseling and provide care that will reduce harms. And number three, by keeping a patient engaged, you create a window of opportunities to offer interventions. So I won't read everything on this slide, but this is just to remind us that there are many things that providers can say and do for patients to help them use safely and to reduce their risk for adverse health consequences. So for patients who do want to reduce their methamphetamine use, what interventions do they want? A Washington survey of syringe service clients who use methamphetamine showed that they wanted many things, but the top two responses were one-to-one -one counseling and medication to reduce their use. The survey unfortunately did not ask about specific med medications, but as you can see, the enthusiasm for mental health medications as a general class was considerably lower. So just a few words about pharmacotherapy for methamphetamine use disorder. As you've heard, there are currently no FDA-approved medications, but I do want to point out that off-label use of medications is a common practice in the real world. Also, many medications and combinations have been studied, but research has not focused specifically on patients with concurrent opioid use disorder, save one study that I could find. A recent meta-analysis concluded that medications evaluated for methamphetamine use disorder have not clearly shown a significant benefit. However, that meta-analysis stated there was, quote, low strength evidence that methylphenidate may reduce use. Since that meta-analysis was published, two additional studies have come out that have showed uh, benefit. The first is a study of mirtazapine, the second a combination of bupropion and long-acting injectable naltrexone. Again, neither was focused specifically on patients with opioid use disorder, although the second study of naltrexone and bupropion stated that 7% of the sample had a concurrent diagnosis of opioid use disorder. Of course, for the many patients with opioid use disorder who were already treated with buprenorphine or methadone, that combination would not be an option since it includes an opioid antagonist. So in summary, methamphetamine use is increasingly common among persons with opioid use disorder and has been shown to be associated with worse retention in buprenorphine treatment. Low barrier buprenorphine programs have demonstrated success, however, engaging patients with opioid use disorder who use stimulants like methamphetamine. 
but we need patient-centered interventions that can be implemented in real-world settings in order to reduce methamphetamine use and improve retention among patients with treated opioid use disorder. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge my research partners and patients, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Judith. Um, we have one question in the chat so far. If you have questions, please type them in the chat. We've got a little bit of time. Uh, hang on, oops, I've lost the chat. Here it is. <laughs> Many drop out within three months. Do they drop out on their own or do you monitor intervening factors like arrest, homelessness, um, getting, uh, discharged from treatment because of substance use or not making co-pays, et cetera. Right. So for our study, we attempted to um, collect reasons for, uh, quote, discharge, which really just meant they were no longer active in the program. Um, and so there were some patients, as I showed you, that discontinued due to incarceration or death or needing a higher level of care. Sometimes they were trans, um, they went to inpatient programs. Um, but I do think that there are many things that are unmeasured, right? I mean, and we don't have the, um, we don't think that we're providers in our program um, were discontinuing uh, medications, but at the same time, we can't rule out that patients do hear um, sort of inherent messages, or there are ways that we express um, stigma, presumably, to patients who with polysubstance use. Um, so I think there are ways as providers that we unconsciously can, um, can turn patients away from us. Um, and, and I, um, while other people add questions, I wanted to make sure that I clarified with you. So sometimes when people think about retention, they think about our individuals retained for three months, for six months, for six months to a year. Um, and, and you talked about the way you define retention as being more restricted than that, I think. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that's a really important point that you bring up, that I think historically these definitions of retention that we've used for studies have been too restrictive. And we know that patients really um, often have lapses in treatment, but then they do re-engage. So um, I think that we do, in research, we should be moving away from those more simplistic uh, definitions that just look at a single care episode and should be trying to measure um, sort of cumulative exposures and number of days receiving treatment. So we have another question in the chat. What's the likelihood that medications for opioid use disorder can be covered by Medicaid? Are there ways to cover medication costs for people who use methamphetamine? Uh, and I think that what he really meant was what's the likelihood that medications for opioid use disorder could be used uh, sort of for, for methamphetamine use disorder and covered by Medicaid. Right. So I should hope that Medicaid would cover medications for opioid use disorder yes. Yes. <laughs> used for that. Yes. Um, so um, as a physician, again, we often prescribe medications off label. And I believe that um, that medications can be prescribed if they're deemed necessary for the condition. Um, I think that, you know, often patients that I see do, if they haven't been formally diagnosed with um, ADHD, they often report um, symptoms that reflect that they may have an underlying diagnosis. So that may be another uh, way to get medications medications covered. And then we had another question in the chat about evidence-based um, uh, therapeutic or behavioral treatments. I think that harkens back perhaps to the talk we had on the last panel for polysubstance use, which looked at um, contingency management and was offering contingency management as one of the most effective behavioral or um, 
non-medication therapeutic interventions. Do you have anything, Judith, that you would add to that? Sorry, one more time. Can you repeat the question? So there was a question in the chat about evidence-based therapeutic or behavioral treatments for polysubstance use. And um, on the last panel, there was a really nice presentation looking at contingency management and meta-analytic studies of contingency management for single and polysubstance use. Um, so outside of contingency management, do you have any other thoughts or um, have, have you uh, in any of your work seen um, contingency management used with people who you may be engaging in medication treatment for opioid use disorder and who are using methamphetamine? Yes. So, I mean, I can only... Um reinforce, I think, what's been said before, that there's a real need to be able to uh, implement contingency management in real world settings for patients, but that requires some reform of uh, the policies around reimbursement for that service. So um, I think it's very sad uh, for providers that we can't readily um, provide uh, an intervention that is shown to be so effective. Um, correct. Okay, thank you very much. And you'll be a part of the final discussion if people have other questions that emerge. So we'll move forward to our second panelist, um, Dr. Gail D'Onofrio. She is the professor and chair in the Department of Emergency Medicine at Yale University and the physician in chief of the emergency services at Yale New Haven Hospital. She is internationally known for her work in developing and testing interventions for alcohol, opioids, and other substance use disorders. And she served as a PI on many studies funded by NIH, but also SAMHSA and CDC. She's currently the principal investigator on two NIDA clinical trials network studies, um, ED innovation that tests the implementation of ED initiated buprenorphine in 30 diverse ED settings across the country and compares different formulations of buprenorphine in engaging patients in treatment. And her unique fact is that in addition to this um, wonderful career and all of the hard work that she has done. She is the mother of 31-year-old triplets. Congratulations for surviving. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thanks, Ratona, for that wonderful introduction. Can you see my slides okay? We can. Okay, good. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about the emergency department perspective and really what our, our whole main goal is really introducing access to care. Um, and my disclosures that I'm funded by a lot of government agencies. And um, first of all, why are we focusing on the emergency department? And that's truly because that's where the patients are. Uh, most of our patients with substance use disorder use the ED as their primary source of care. Approximately one in every 80 visits to the ED are opiate related, and just in that respect alone can cost $5 billion per year. Not all, and this is where we're talking today about all substances, so not all that looks like an opiate overdose is an opiate overdose. This is just an example of um, something that happened in New Haven in 2018, where we had 52 patients that um, created 111 ED visits, 49 of those presented within 10 hours. They were variable presentations, all with altered mental status, but they ranged from agitated delirium to really comatose. There were no deaths, but there were two intubations required um, during that, and it all turned out to be um, synthetic cannabinoids, and those are the type, specific types of those cannabinoids that were, um, that were found to be in the specimens, and 
it uh, it was it was actually a result of several drug dealers who were giving out free free samples apparently on the green for quite a long period of time, but did cause us quite um, a lot of work and supportive care, and also just trying to figure out what substances these individuals had since they really presented in all different types of presentations. Um, we know that COVID-19 has done a number and really has collided with our opiate epidemic particularly. And I thank Dr. Holland from the CDC who just published this article in JAMA Psychiatry, which really showed here on the left that this is exactly where COVID really struck in April of last year, that although ED visits markedly went down almost 40%, mental health conditions um, increased. Overall, all overdoses increased and so did opiates. And when you look on the right hand side, you can see the weekly change in total visits. Um, and so in the bottom here, while our total ED visits went down in red, the percent change in opiate overdose really did increase. So it's slightly leveling, it is leveling off now. And then um, all overdoses. So um, we are fortunate that SAMHSA um, just released our evidence-based resource guide using medications for opiate use disorder. Um, and this guide um, it really showed not only um, our original, highlighted our original article um, from JAMA, but also um, many other sites who've been um, adopting um, ED-initiated buprenorphine. And it was a resource for a lot of emergency departments about um, myths um, and based on practices. Um, this is an article we published um, not too long ago that looked at the trends of use in um, emergency departments. And you can see since we published in 2015, um, this article was a cross-sectional study we did using 2002 to 2017 data for from the National Hospital Ambulatory Medical Care Service. And you can see that it went up um, at least threefold during that period of time, but we still have a lot more to go. Some of the things I wanted to say that we learned from our CTN um, 69 that Dr. Valine and I are the lead um, investigators in 79 with Dr. McCormick and Hawk, um, we did um, focus groups with patients and this is really what they said. Um, they wanted low barrier access to treatment in an ED, particularly after overdose. Even though we as providers may not think they do, they do. And they sense that the staff um, do not really understand addiction or perceive it as a medical disease. And their perception is that we minimize their medical issues and their pain and we don't take it seriously. And they do feel stigmatized by our care. Although very recently there is some variability in that as we um, spoke to patients over time. And there were some real positive experiences that were good with clinicians. And we hope to build on this and change the climate of the ED. Today, there are no standardized and broadly implemented ED-based detection intervention referral protocols for patients that have both opiates and um, amphetamine-type stimulus use. This is what we do know from talking to um, emergency physicians around the country that uh, methamphetamine use promotes more chaotic and unpredictable opiate use that is fluctuating use amounts and it's irregular. So the typical activated state of opiate withdrawal is often diminished as they would like to as the patients become sedated and often used for that purpose by patients. Um, and the CAL score, the clinical opiate withdrawal skills are often very inaccurate. Withdrawal of methamphetamine binge results in severe somnolence that then can confound it. And also as that happens, um, and they're using opiates with that coming off of the meth, that hypersomnolence can actually lead to more overdose and hypoxia than would normally be the case with what kinds of opiates that they would use. Um, we did study in uh, 69, um, in our baseline study, we looked at amphetamine type stimulant used among these four emergency departments that we have been working with. And we did find that, that um, there, it was associated with distinct sociographic, social, and health factors. And we used four groups, as you can see, four EDs, um, Mount Sinai in New York, Johns Hopkins in Maryland, University of Cincinnati in Ohio, and Harborview in Seattle, Washington. And you can see that um, that amphetamine use was, uh, was increasing 
as we moved uh, west. So not so much on the East Coast, more in um, mid country, and then of course more in um, Seattle. What we found was differences between those patients who um, had opiate, who had um, amphetamine type stimulants versus those that didn't in our patients that were all opiate, had all obese disorder. They were white, and these were all significant, the ones I'm telling you, they were unemployed. They had unstable housing. They had been recently incarcerated. They were more likely to use injection drugs. They were more likely to present with injury. And most also importantly is that they um, were less likely to be seeking treatment in the ED, less likely to be using other stimulants such as cocaine. Um, in our study that we are, is ongoing ED innovation, which is really 27 sites around the country who, uh, who are um, actually formed a network trial. It's a hybrid type one implementation effectiveness trial. And first of all, um, all of the EDs did um, initiate ED um, buprenorphine protocols. Um, I separated the country by the Mississippi River as several other um, authors have done um, looking at fentanyl and other, and other drugs. Um, I then looked at um, what happened within those sites. And this study compares the effectiveness of, of um, long-acting buprenorphine, the seven-day injectable, with the sublingual buprenorphine and engagement and treatment um, at seven days. But I separated these groups. And if you looked at them overall, we have um, samples from urine from the substances from this group of 361 patients so far. Um, 18 sites um, that contributed are on the East Coast and east of the Mississippi and eight sites were to the west of the Mississippi. If you look here, you can see as, as many of the speakers have talked about that opiates and other use of other drugs is very common in the entire group, 83% are using other drugs as well. And that's pretty consistent no matter where you are. Opiate marijuana also is, is um, pretty consistent in about 50% of the population throughout the US. Opiate and benzodiazepines actually was much lower than we had um, reported in our initial JAMA study. Um, there were less people using benzodiazepines, um, more so on the East than the West. Um, and fentanyl only, which everyone is always interested in, there were very few people who just used fentanyl, more so on the East than the West, but these numbers are low. But combining fentanyl and other drugs was very common. Two thirds of our population um, used other drugs. That was most likely um, on the East Coast than the West Coast. And now when we look at particularly opioids and stimulants, opiate and methamphetamine um, were present in about a third of our population. And that was much more prevalent on the West Coast as you see, almost 50% of patients had both in their urine. If we add all the amphetamine type stimulants, which is really amphetamines um, plus methamphetamine, it was similarly more on the West Coast with just a few more. And if we look at opiate and any stimulants, which is really adding um, cocaine primarily and a little bit of PCP, we could see that um, about 57, almost 60% of the population is doing that. And um, that is more frequent on the West Coast again, because it's the meth and ATS as well. So we are um, really able to look at some surveillance data, as you can see, um, on pretty real time amount. So what um, are the possible treatment strategies uh, from the ED that we know of today, which aren't very many, but um, first we treat the life threatening threatening disease with known benefit. So we are able to treat um, with um, buprenorphine. Because of the irregular use of the opiates, that makes the chance of taking these daily buprenorphine unlikely or people are not staying in treatment. There are two options that could be tested here. One is the uh, use of an extended release um, injection, whether that's starting with seven days, but going on as in the follow-up case and using more 30-day um, injections would be something to think about. Also, the use of um, high-dose buprenorphine, which we are studying as part of 69A, um, that has shown to be safe and effective, um, that may bridge this gap between the person who's in the emergency department and getting them to some treatment of which then one could institute things like 
um, contingency management or other more involved um, psychosocial interventions. Um, harm reduction um, could also focus on the binge use of methamphetamines and treating their insomnia and thought disorders. And we may be able to provide some access to mood stabilizing drug sleep aids and antipsychotics with help from our addiction um, friends, both from addiction medicine and psychiatry. The questions, and finally, I'll leave this open that we really need to answer and opportunities for the emergency department with uh, really adding on to more of the um, HEAL initiative is that we are missing these critical tools. So we do need to test some of those pharmaco and behavioral interventions. Um, they are complex in terms of the behavioral interventions and we would need uh, funding uh, from insurers and that would be private or, you know, or CMS to help us with that. Um, we also know we have to address this vulnerable population because it truly is much more than we have ever seen in other populations. And um, we need to test these strategies that would promote um, access and linkage to care. So would that be longer acting um, buprenorphine treatments? Would it be um, high dose buprenorphine um, to get them there, whatever? And um, we are fortunate and hopeful that we can use this um, network of ED investigators um, for surveillance, because it seems really important that we were able to look at prevention and treatment in these real time um, data sets that are different than what we normally see, which are in the overdose and death rates um, data. So we have an opportunity to provide that uh, surveillance. And also we have opportunities in this network to test some of these other possible treatment um, therapies of which we could get. And really our point is accessing people to care. So I thank you. And I thank all of the investigators that are associated with all of these trials, which are too many to really mention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gail. If people have questions, please type them into the chat. Um, and uh, while we wait for people to type in questions, I'll um, uh, ask you about something. Um, you know, you're on a, a panel that looks at uh, retention in care, and what you're talking about is getting people on sort of an episodic basis, but um, as you have indicated, they often will use the emergency department as their source of care. So in addition to just initiating or getting people started, like what role could the emergency department play as people are going in and out in retention and ongoing care? So the emergency department is really there for a really um, also introducing uh, care, but we also are here all the time for acute exacerbations of chronic diseases. So it's not unusual that we see people that have hyperglycemia, for example, that have issues, people that have hypertension and, and all the other medical ramifications from other medical diseases. So we are gonna see people who perhaps return to use or perhaps fall out of treatment or um, even this week we saw somebody who just had a horrific life experience and they had been on buprenorphine for a very long period of time and then started heroin use or probably fentanyl from New Haven um, because of this um, issue that had just come up. And then we were just able to talk to, to him get him back on the buprenorphine treatments and get him back to his care. So that's really what the ED will do. Um, whether it's acute or chronic illness exacerbation, we can handle both and hopefully just get people back on the right track. And then another um, question uh, came into the chat. Can you talk about whether EDs might be a good setting for a parallel strategy to start buprenorphine sublingually or um, long-term in teens, 12 to 17, who appear with um, overdoses. Are you seeing this demographic showing up in emergency departments who are adolescents? Um, we are seeing adolescents who are coming in and we're fortunate here in New Haven to have Dr. Kamengay, who is a um, adolescent addiction specialist who starts people on um, buprenorphine. 
And we're hoping to study that. I think um, you will see that there's an application by her and another a colleague from the West Coast. Um, because these cases are relatively few, although each case is really important, it's hard to get a huge sample size of them, but we, we they're clearly there and they're really understudied in terms of what are the best um, uh, treatment strategies, but we are um, initiating buprenorphine um, with, with the adolescent addiction medicine help here in New Haven. And then another question, can patients become dependent on buprenorphine after taking the 30-day XR buke? Um, not sure what you mean by dependent on bup. I mean, people are already have opiate use disorder, so they already have um, meet criteria for moderate to severe opiate use disorder before they are started on it. So, so um, it is a treatment, and after that 30 days, well, we're doing the seven days, but after the 30 days, then they would use um, additional buprenorphine, or they could. Um, transition off with their um, provider if that's thought to be the right thing to do. Um, and then maybe one uh, final question is, um, you know, COVID um, meant that people were accessing treatment much less and even when they really needed to go to the emergency department were going much less. The flip side of that is that emergency departments and staff have been so besieged with COVID patients that it's been difficult for them to think about capacity to be able to do something different within their EDs like initiating buprenorphine. So can you speak a little bit to um, what, what you've seen happen over the past year with COVID and about kind of the, the future of this as we move forward? Sure, I think uh, emergency departments um, really saw that decrease in overall visits back in March. We're almost all back now to at least 85 to 90% of our normal um, amounts. We have learned those, and this has been, this implementation has happened all over the country, so I'm very excited to say it's like all over, that um, one can identify individuals and initiate treatment in less than an urgent care visit in less than 90 minutes. And people are learning that. And we have shown um, that people would be less likely to come back to the ED if they have treatment, which is always a goal of an emergency physician. Um, and so there's no reason in the world not to do this. And I'm also happy to see the American College of Emergency Physicians has really come out on front of this. You will soon uh, will be published a consensus recommendation that all EDs are equipped to um, offer um, buprenorphine to all untreated patients with opiate use disorder. Great. Um, okay, we had one more question from Shannon, and Shannon, I'm going to hold your question until we get the whole panel back together, but I've already, I've cut and copied it and saved it for myself, and then, um, and then we will get to that. So next, I'm happy to introduce um, Dr. Rebecca Jackson, who is a Max Morehouse Chair of Cancer Research and the Founding Director of the Ohio State University Center for Clinical and Translational Science. She's also the Associate Dean for Clinical and Translational Research and a Professor of Internal Medicine at The Ohio State University. Uh, her area of research has concentrated on women's health with a specific focus on defining predictive analytics and prevention strategies for diseases that disproportionately affect older women and men and translating these findings into improving the health of individuals and their communities. She brought together a research team of six Ohio academic centers, 19 communities, and the Recovery Ohio initiative to participate in the Healing Community Study. And she has also used a similar community-based participatory research model to address health inequities in COVID-19 testing through RADx up. She has many um, awards uh, and uh, is, a, is a very uh, well-known investigator. And if you know 
Becky at all, you know that um, she bleeds the color of Buckeye red. She is an avid Buckeye football fan, and she's missed less than 12 games since she was five years old. So, Dr. Jackson, take it away. For the panel, um, Philip Rutherford, he is the Chief Operating Officer at Faces and Voices of Recovery. He's a recovery coach and a passionate member of the recovery community. And he possesses a self-described doctorate from the School of Hard Knocks. As the Chief Operating Officer, he's responsible for multiple lines of business within Faces and Voices. He's credited with a significant role in the conception, design, launch, and facilitation of the recovery data platform, which is a cloud-based platform um, and the first of its kind that's quickly become a valuable asset and longitudinal data collection for peer-based services. He has a BA in psychology with a specialization in substance use disorders. Um, and his prior experience was as a director of a recovery community organization. Um, he spent much of his career in corporate sales, marketing, and management at Microsoft. Uh, Micron Electronics and companies within the Taylor Corporation. He's an active member of the recovery community and has considerable experience in the areas of substance use disorder, recovery, reentry, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And one interesting fact outside of his work life is that Philip once climbed half the dome in Yosemite. Um, he said he was much younger then, but it was excellent. He also did some base climbing in El Capitan. Excellent. So with that, you're... Thanks a lot. Um, I, I appreciate that. And I, I always think of when I, when I think about the time uh, that I spent on Half Dome, it was, it was not only younger, I was a lot lighter. I don't get accused a lot of being a mountain climber these days. But anyway, uh, so we're here to talk about uh, keeping them in the boat. Um, and I appreciate all of the all the presentations before me. I, I was having trouble keeping all of the data in my head and I'm a data guy, um, but I, I kind of want to I want to level set with what what I'm going to be talking about. And at Faces and Voices, we we promote peer recovery support services and, and what, what that looks like in communities. So my talk is gonna focus on how we identify long-term recovery stability. We're gonna talk a little bit about RCC and RCOs, which those are acronyms for recovery community centers and recovery community organizations. And I know some people on the call are probably familiar with those terms, but I always like to cover them anyway, just in case a few of you aren't. Um, we're going to talk about some similarities and differences between those two models. I want to talk about one of the things that I'm very passionate about, which is data driven recovery. And then I'll share some of the data gathering that we've done uh, over the past three, I guess now four years. So a recovery community center and a recovery community organization are, are fairly similar organizations. They're basically nonprofit centers for recovery. Um, in the case of a center, it's usually a physical location and it's a place within a community where people uh, with substance use disorder or with just with substance misuse challenges can go and receive uh, recovery support services. If you're not familiar with the recovery support services term, these are, I think if you, if you think of maybe even like a public health navigator or, or services that would help anyone get access to other services in the community. Those are some of the things that go on at recovery community centers. The chief difference between that and a recovery community organization is that a recovery community organization may do a few other things. They may do some actual policy advocacy or some community education as well. Um, most of them are peer operated, they're nonprofit organizations and they are absolutely community based. Um, so the, onto the important stuff. One of the things that we at Faces and Voices believe, and, and certainly something I've, I've spent um, the past four years on almost exclusively, is really driving 
the practice of data collection and, and data usage even into the into the recovery process. So if you could imagine for a second, someone uh, goes through a treatment experience and finds their way to a recovery community center and starts working with a peer support person. Now I recognize that that is already a very select group of people. I recognize that is not that is not the masses. That's that's a, a smaller subset of people. But we we like to insert evidence based practices, and we have a, a group called the Association of Recovery Community Organizations, of which there are about 150 of these around the country. Um, and when someone walks into one of those. Uh, they might be presented with one of these scales, like the, the BARC 10 or the outcome rating scale. And the outcome rating scale is a, uh, it's a, a measurement of distress. So again, picture someone walking in and we're, we do an assessment and this assessment's done on a tablet or, or it can even be done on a phone. There's an app version of it, but someone assesses some basic information about distress, how, how their life is going, how their social relationships are going, how their interactions are going. And over a period of visits, over a period of weeks and months, we start to get a profile or, or a heartbeat of what that looks like, right? So on the top of uh, this, the top chart that you see there, and again, I know I apologize for how small it is, but it's something that looks like an EKG. And that, that is a series of results from that outcome rating scale. The chart immediately beneath that, and this is sample data, but the chart immediately beneath that is a, a, an index, if you will, of what that person's outlook rating scale, I'm sorry, outcome rating scale and their craving ratings. So we also track cravings to see if people are having difficulty with cravings. And we can overlay some of this data and look at, is there a relationship between, between how a person is, what their outlook is on their life and how much they're craving a particular substance. And we call this the duh chart, right? Like in a shocking turn of events, sometimes people with substance use disorder, if they if they don't feel all that good about their life, sometimes there's an increase in, in craving, right? Duh. But it's, it is helpful, not just for the person that is that is doing the peer support work, but I've seen this have profound effect on the person that is in recovery, because this is this is not some chart that we hide in the back room and talk about in staffing. This is something that we expose to the person in recovery and say, this is what your, this is what your recovery experience is looking like. So that just a couple, that's, that's just sort of an overview. Um, for, for those of you that are familiar with the term recovery capital, recovery capital is a, a an index of internal and external assets that a person has that are uh, supportive of the, of long term recovery, but we track that. We've recently introduced the PHQ nine and the GAD seven into our um, into our test kits or into the into the interface, so people can take those and the system scores them. And it's just more more information about the recovery process because remember the idea is it's about keeping keeping them in the boat, right? Keeping people engaged in the recovery process over a period of time. Um, just some basic demographics about who's coming in and out of, of the places that are associated with ours. This, this data is largely, and again, I think these presentations are gonna be made public, um, or not all of them, but some of them will be. Uh, our, our demographics look similar to to most treatment centers. Um, the well, not not all the treatment centers, but most public treatment centers, our, our data looks similar to that. Um, we pay a lot of attention to social determinants of health, and we scale people for employment, stable housing, what how they rate themselves as it pertains to mental health, what their educational level is, what their what what they want to do with that. Um, and I want to, I just want to highlight these two particular charts. I mentioned that outcome rating scale, which is the measure of distress, and also the relationship rating scale, which is a measure of therapeutic alliance between therapeutic alliance between the person and the peer that they're working with. One of the things that we've seen over, over a period of years is that, again, this is another duh chart, people engaged in services tend to have a better outlook about their life and a better therapeutic alliance with people they work with over a period of time, right? And it's not that no one knew that, and it's not that that's not brand new information, but in terms of dealing with people that are 
practicing long-term recovery in the community and not engaged in direct clinical services, um, this, is, this is a new piece of data. Also the BARC-10, um, as people stay in recovery, again, shocking turn of events, uh, their recovery capital scores go up. One last thing I wanna show you is the, uh, when we call it recovery 2.0, I've heard a couple of people mention contingency management. We have a number of centers around the country that are using, uh, we have a, a module for recovery management. So what we've basically done is split life into 13 different domains. And then the centers can assign uh, goals and goal attainment with rewards associated with those domains in, in the system. And basically people measure themselves against that. And there's a kind of a clever app version of this that people can carry around with them. And think of the person that is wanting to get, they want to apply for uh, entry to college, um, but there are some steps in the way there. First thing is they need to, maybe they don't have a GED, so they need to go and sign up for GED and they need to, um, maybe they need to get another piece of information in order to get that done. So this, the system can help them track through that and, and offer, offer rewards or, or even simple appreciation for them achieving those tasks. And we've seen a great, like probably over the past 18 months or so, we've seen a real big uptick in, in this and, and centers using this and developing, uh, developing essentially a, like there's a treatment plan when you go to treatment, almost a recovery management plan when someone is involved with, uh, uh, with a recovery community organization. So anyway, the point of all of this is that that data collection helps the individual maintain long-term recovery. That's it. Those are our brands. That's all I've got. Thank you very much. Um, we've got time for a couple of questions specific to the last presentation. And then if all of the other panelists will um, come back into view, then we can ask and talk about um, any questions or any discussion that might be uh, available for the panel. This was a really, really great panel. Um, I, I guess, so one question for you is, um, in terms of recovery and recovery capital, do you see differences in your work or do you all um, do anything differently with someone who might have an opioid use disorder versus polysubstance? I'm, like I'm what's your you, data tell you and what's your experience? I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, and I, I actually uh, was going to, I was going to say that in the beginning of my talk. Um, I don't have a record of anyone walking into any center ever, anywhere and saying, I have polysubstance use disorder. Um, that's not the dialogue. And it, it, even, even in cases where people have affinity and maybe they, maybe they have opioid use disorder as a primary diagnosis, our, our intake data, and we ask, um, we use the uh, ICD-10 coding for uh, when we're when people are are coming into them, very rarely do we see single use disorder. Almost, I, I I think the numbers are in the high 80s in terms of people that come in with a single substance use disorder. Um, so that that's what the data says. Anecdotally, we don't make those uh, distinctions at the at the community support level. Uh, it's actually counterproductive to say, hey, you, what's that? Your OUD and STEMUD, you go over here and you get this thing. The only place where that makes a difference is where there's a, if there's a, if there's medication, then fine, that's, there's medication. But in terms of the, so we talk of the biopsychosocial. So if the bio is a, if there's a medication that's needed, that's one thing, but the psychosocial is, is absolutely, um, we actually seek to group people together in that way rather than distinguish between the, the differences. Great. Um, so we had a couple of questions earlier in the chat. Um, one of them was about 
what advice do you have for the best ways to engage local emergency departments and participating in starting youth and referral partnerships with uh, a telemedicine MAT program? I think that's probably for Gail. And then a question about um, what are your thoughts about getting hospitals involved in testing for fent the presence of fentanyl? Um, if so, if you want to, I'm not exactly sure what this question means, but I do see it um, in terms of connecting with uh, others. Um, the ED um, will always initiate the buprenorphine and we can clearly um, partner with anybody in the community. Um, and we, during COVID, we have done that very well by uh, telemedicine. Um, our providers have taken patients who have been initiated and then seen them on telemedicine. Um, and even without the telemedicine, just the telephone, <laughs> um, they've been able to work with them. Um, with the relaxing of the regs, um, and hopefully that will continue. But um, your ED, um, what you would have to do is if you have emergency departments in your area that you want to work with, then you should go over and talk to the medical director there and um, see what kinds of arrangements could be made. Emergency physicians are readily able to and want to work with the community and are looking for these kind of connections. So don't be shy about calling up and asking to talk to someone. Hey, and not that anyone asked me, but there is good data out there on engaging peer supports in emergency rooms uh, around overdose uh, and people that have had situations with overdose and uh, effectiveness of it. That's great. Um, so Phil, a question for you. What are the most pressing research gaps in addressing recovery support? Uh, the psychosocial component. Um, there is, there, there's plenty of evidence that medical interventions work. Uh, specifically in OUD, and we're, we're coming along with, with the STEM UD stuff. Um, and people have said to me on more than one occasion that, you know, where is the evidence for these other approaches? Um, and what my response is frequently that the, one of the things about uh, the medical approaches is that there, there's been a chain of custody associated with medication. So the, these, these things have been researched almost from the time they were introduced as a treatment methodology, whereas some of the psychosocial things that have been in place have have not had that. So I think it's worth it's worth investigating it's worth investigating them as well. And what, one of the things that's been sort of loosely hinted at, but not really talked about a lot um, throughout the day um, is stigma. And it seems that this particular uh, panel might uh, be able to talk about stigma a little bit, um, both stigma for the evidence-based practices, the medications and the patient populations and um, any differences that you see between uh, community level stigma related to opioid use disorder versus like methamphetamine. So if, if everybody wants to sort of take a round robin and, and, and give a few thoughts on that, we, we could go in reverse order and actually start with Phil. Um, sure. Um, so definitely stigma plays a role in just about every component of what we're doing with, with substance use disorder. And it, it kind of caught me off guard because I was thinking about Jack's question regarding uh, gaps. And I said psychosocial, but there's another area that I have to mention. And that is culturally responsive treatment period, like gaps into, into what that looks like. And I just, I want to, sh I'll, I'll share a quick story. I apologize for storytelling, but this is really important. I had a conversation with someone that was applying for work with us. And this person grew up in the church 
and this person was not applying for a recovery focused job. This is an administrative job. And she said, you know what, I'm sorry, I don't really know anyone in rec recovery. And I asked her if she knew anyone that had had a drinking problem or maybe had a, a drug problem. And now they weren't. She said, oh, yeah, I know a bunch of people that would do that. And now they're saved and they don't do that anymore. Right. And her like and so and the reason I'm, I'm mentioning this is there in, in her mind, there was a whole culture of like in her her experience, there's a whole group of people that were experiencing recovery, but in her language, it didn't exist. So as far as she knew, no one was in recovery. But once we had the conversation and we had this dialogue, there was an entire group of people in recovery. So culturally responsive stuff is very important. Stigma um, is a, I think about intersection when I think about stigma. So not only is there, not only is there the stigma of um, the individual, there's the stigma of the substance, right? Like. If, it's not that we haven't gotten past stigma of alcohol use, um, but there is even a difference in the stigma associated with um, opioid use that is pill abuse and opioid use that is intravenous uh, heroin use, right? So we just, we have a ton of work to do there. And I don't wanna take up any more time from the rest of the panel. And, and Becky, what about you in terms of uh, community level stigma and how that intersects around these issues of polysubstance and opioid use disorder for the healing community study. I think probably stigma is one of our greatest problems. Um, and, and clearly our coalitions um, are probably the most aware um, of, of the issues. Um, and yet at getting effective messaging out that targets multiple levels from providers to communities to people who um, with lived experience all the way to um, policymakers um, in the communities critical for the success um, of interventions like the communities that, that heal intervention. And in fact, it was such a critically important part of the success for the um, implementation and adoption of evidence-based practices and bringing together multiple sectors to work together in an integrated fashion, which is really the central part of the hypothesis is can we do it more effectively together than we can do it separately in terms of addressing um, that we actually made that one of the three pillars of the intervention. Um, and so, you know, I think that we will learn a lot um, from our communication campaigns from understanding how different sectors within our community have been impacted by um, stigma and how that changes across time um, as they get data-driven answers um, to better understand what's going on in their communities. Great. And Gail, what about you and your work in emergency department stigma, um, stigma toward different types of substance use, stigma toward the medication that you're trying to use, et cetera. So obviously it's a big problem. ASAP had a conference last um, January with multiple stakeholders to try to figure out how we could address this. Um, and so we have come up with a, a few strategies. One of those is really um, engaging role models in, in each of the different EDs and so they can role model what they are. We've also um, shared these focus groups that we've gotten in what patients think um, about the ED as a source of care and the stigmati stigmatization they feel. So we are just uh, feeding that back. Um, we're also trying to monitor and give feedback to the providers so that the providers see their successes and not always their failures, because that's usually all they see is they think that people are coming back. Um, but they don't always know about their successes. So we give them um, feedback and monitoring about that. So it's it's hard. Um, and I, I think it is stigma that the physicians aren't addressing this and, and giving out the medication. I mean, there is nothing about it. What reason would you have for not initiating a life-threatening medication? Um, so we're, we're hammering it in many different ways to the providers. Um, and uh, we're hoping that we're getting better. We, we had a little bit of 
of positivity from our recent focus groups that said that things were getting a little better, that there was some variability. So we're hoping we're on the we're on the other end of that, but it's a continual struggle. And Judith, what about you in terms of your work? Yeah, so we actually just um, completed a qualitative study uh, looking at treatment seeking experiences for people who inject drugs. Um, and it was really heartbreaking, the stories that we heard about um, stigma and the experiences that patients had had um, with stigma when they were seeking medical care. Um, I do think there are certainly very um, egregious cases of provider enacted stigma. And unfortunately, once a patient has had a bad experience that can keep them from seeking care for a very long time. Um, we also heard a lot about internalized stigma too. Um, patients feeling like, well, uh, you know, when we ask them about hepatitis C treatment, well, I, I really can't ask for treatment. I, I don't deserve to be treated until I take care of my drug use first. So, um, very, very disturbing stories. Um, I do think that as providers, one of the ways that we can address this is simply to go out into the community more and to offer treatment in places um, where patients historically haven't um, received treatment and to really try to draw patients in and treat them in a compassionate, respectful manner that really is the cornerstone of, of harm reduction theory. Great. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions coming into the chat at this point. Uh, I'll give you all an opportunity that are on the panel to see if you have questions for one another. I know that we met and talked um, before, but since you've seen each other's presentations, do you all have a question you want to pose to another panelist? I have a question for Phil. Um, I think it's fascinating the idea to um, start to expand um, peer navigators and peer recovery coaches um, to incorporate more of the the, the sort of data. And I'm wondering when you listen to the lectures about um, some of the um, the uh, mobile health interventions. Um, what what is your thinking about how we can best integrate sort of the human touch of um, peer recovery coaches? Because we know that those therapeutic relationships are so important with technology um, that sometimes can seem out of you know um, out of access for for a lot of patients or out of reach. Well, I, I think first things first is just getting peer or recovery support services as a part of the dialogue, right? So at, at a very fundamental level, um, like, I, like I mentioned with the emergency room things, like I, I live in Rochester, Minnesota, and we had one of, the, one of the first programs nationally where we were bringing recovery support workers into, into the emergency room um, and saw really good results from that because of what you said, because there's that, there's that relationship building. And I, and I think even, even with all of the research and even with all of the understanding of the chronic or uh, long-term nature of substance use disorder, a, a lot of times it still ends up being these little brief interventions. Um, and my experience with recovery is that, that it happens over a period of time. It's longitudinal. It, it, it takes time for, for that to work. And in order for that to work, you need people in place working with the individual. Um, and that's, that's really where peer comes into, comes into play. And if no one is, if no one has that awareness and if they don't have that, if they don't have that understanding and they think of it as, okay, here's the intervention, we're gonna give the medication and that is the solution. And, and in some cases, we know that that is, we know that there are people that can simply get bup and they're good. Right, but there are also people that can simply get bup, and that's not enough. And if we don't provide those those recovery support services, um, we end up seeing those people back 
again and again and overdose and sometimes unfortunately um, they lose their lives as a result of it. So, um, and I, I, I make this, um, I make this description all the time, right? Like, so treatment, treatment or interventions are, are this, right? They're these, they're these bite-sized things, but recovery is a continuum. And, and to what we want to do is insert recovery support wherever the individual needs it. There's some individuals that go to our um, recovery community organizations that will never darken the door of a treatment center. They'll never see a therapist. It's just not their thing, but they'll go to a recovery community center, work with a peer, a peer support person and go on about their life. So we want to, we want to provide those, that access um, at all phases of the illness rather than, rather than just in those little doses. The one comment in the chat, um, you know, in, in thinking about uh, what research is needed, the comment is that we need recovery services to be nationally billable so they're sustainable. So we need a robust enough evidence base um, to, to get reimbursement and, and, and to get this paid for, um, for sure. Um, okay, so thank you all so much for your uh, presentation. Um, there's one final question that I'll ask, and then I'm going to turn it back over to Michelle and Dr. Volkoff to close out the meeting. Could Phil please elaborate on the role of stigma on seeking and maintaining self-help group or peer recovery support during the recovery journey? Um, it's a challenge. Um, and like I said, or like I alluded to earlier, um, there are layers of stigma um, and layers of, um, even within recovery communities, there are layers of stigma. And, and, and it's just a matter of, and I'm, I'm not trying to be too cute, but putting a face and a voice to the recovery experience is one of the most important things that people can do, right? So I'm a, I'm a person in, I'm living in, in long-term recovery. And um, like having other people in my life and other people in the community that's, that can speak to that and, and talk about the recovery experience as something other than my life was terrible and then I'm not, not now my life's not terrible and I'm just okay. Like that's, that's one thing but having advocates in the space that can actually say, well, no, my life's really good, right? And my experience is really, is really good and I'm fulfilled and I get to do stuff like this. And, and I, you know, and I get to make a meaningful, purposeful commitment to life. Like having people do that helps with the stigma, but there are, there are way more people in the world that view substance use disorder as something to be gotten over and then never discussed. Right, and until we until we work on that, and until we take meaningful stabs at that, which will take money, time, effort, all the above, um, we'll continue to have this cycle. Thank you. I think that's a great way to end. Thank you to everyone who presented. Um, great presentations. Lots of things to think about. So I'm going to turn the meeting uh, back over to Michelle. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for attending our meeting. Um, right now, I'd like to re reintroduce Dr. Volkov to provide some closing remarks. Dr. Volkov. Michelle, thanks a lot. And I want to thank all of the participants. This was really a phenomenal meeting. And it actually definitively activated my, my neurons and made me think about in terms of the different perspectives that were expressed today. As I started, we've known that polysubstance use is a very common presentation. And these uh, patterns though are becoming um, more challenging because of the combinations of more, increasingly more dangerous drugs that has been accelerated by COVID. The other reality is that I predict that these patterns will continue after COVID has been solved with vaccination and that we're going to be increasingly seeing uh, more and more the, the abuse and misuse of synthetic drugs because they are much more potent and they are more profitable for the, the drug market and they are easier to sneak into the country. So that is, I think, a reality that we have to um, be aware of and alongside 
start to think in ways of um, that the science or the knowledge that we need in order to be better able to prepare to prevent them and treat them. As I was listening to everybody and I was looking at myself critically, I come to realize that one of the problems that we, that we face in terms of the knowledge that we have is been always we've targeted um, this theoretical clean, pure idea of, of addiction. So we, for example, I've been doing imaging for all my professional life and we excluded individuals that have concurrent uh, substance use disorders were the, that were not the one that we were predominantly aiming to investigate. And that was very challenging to recruit those patients. And now it's almost impossible to the point that I have been forced like many of us to realize that this is all uh, only not only not practical, but it's counterproductive because the treatments that we are developing are not going to be reflecting the realities that patients are fighting out into the community. And in terms of the points that are within that back, background, the points that actually have emerged that I want to comment um, in the presentations. And again, my, my perspective and what I'm saying is very much right now colored by the changes that I have undergone as observing how science can be done so very differently during the COVID pandemic. And that relates to how processes that took forever to get done can now be accelerated. And therefore, again, my critical brain saying, uh, how do you, we maintain and sustain those expectations for accelerated development of knowledge and solution? One of them is the need to have more timely data as it relates to the type of drugs that communities are being exposed to. This is fundamentally we want to do prevention, but also fundamentally we want to actually do therapeutic interventions. From the presentations that we heard today, it is clear that there is tremendous geographic uh, diversity and that the patterns and trajectories of the use of drugs within individuals is significantly different. And in these differences also rely uh, the expectations that the treatment interventions are going to be distinct. I think that uh, what is common across all of these trajectories is the frequent uh, utilization of multiple substances, is the frequent comorbidity uh, with other conditions that make these individuals vulnerable. And that with chronicity on drug use, this actually gets exacerbated. And recognizing as we think about interventions that those interventions need to be taking this into account. In terms of therapeutic development, it is also clear that the current trajectories that we have of the amount of time that it takes to get a medication into the clinics is way too long and that we need to find and figure out ways to accelerate that. An, an opportunity, a low hanging fruit is that one of uh, finding uh, products for new indications, as well as the opportunity that we have that has been taken by other areas, areas of medicine of drug combinations. And I think that the recent uh, success uh, on the study on moderate to severe methamphetamine addiction published in the New England Journal of Medicine from the Clinical Trials Network, indicating that the combination of bupropion and naltrexone actually significantly improved outcomes in a, is an example in terms of the need to take advantage of medications that if we combine are likely to have a more potent effect, as mentioned, as we do for many areas of medicine. Another extremely important point, and, and Christian mentioned it, and we've been very, very much working towards it, the recognition that just mm, uh, focusing on one outcome as the only potentially positive effect of a medication and substance use disorders have been totally counterproductive. Not only is it a very high bar to achieve to have full abstinence, the, the, the issue is by expecting that very high abstinence outcome, we may have missed the opportunity for detecting positive therapeutic benefits of medications in improving, for example, depression, which is one of the factors that results in, in, in relapse, in improving sleep patterns, which is another factor associated with a relapse. And as Chris was mentioning, in decreasing craving. 
So expanding the outcomes that we look into is likely to be another means for us to be able to, to um, accelerate and succeed in the development of therapeutics. Um, Christopher also discussed the tremendous potential that machine learning and artificial intelligence has in terms of helping us identify targets that may have potential benefit. Using those approaches, for example, Dr. Rong um, recently uncovered that the use of olanzapine was actually associated with greater likelihood of um, recovering from an opioid use disorder. And this is just an example. There are many other papers that have actually also taken advantage of it and that are point, pointing to potential therapeutics. In terms of interventions, again, it is uh, highlighted in all of the presentations is that we should not just uh, restrict ourselves to a particular um, setup for doing the intervention, whether it is healthcare or justice settings or community settings. What it is clear is that multi-pronged approaches as basically uh, evaluated right now on the healing community studies are the ones that are likely to be more successful. But within that context, it's also clear that psychosocial interventions are fundamental. Challenges as were discussed also throughout the meeting relate to the lack of reimbursement for psychosocial interventions. And the question that follows is the one of what is it that we need to do or can research to in order to ensure and to facilitate that those psychosocial interventions are reimbursed. It is clear also within that same context because of the complexities and the very damaging effects that addiction has to the individual and his environment that person-centered support is actually in many instances uh, very beneficial. On the behavioral interventions, we saw data uh, clearly that have documented that contingency management is an effective intervention and that we need to provide um, access to uh, such a behavioral intervention as widely as possible. It's currently the most effective intervention that we have for methamphetamine use disorders. In, in that line of discussion, uh, the value of digital therapeutics has also become increasingly recognized across all of medicine, including the treatment of substance use disorders. I think that this also at the same time alert us, yes, it makes treatment much more accessible, not just for induction into medications for opioid use disorder or other treatments and support for um, psychotherapeutic uh, interventions or for comorbid conditions. But that, those benefits are going to be valuable as long as individuals have access to those technologies. And I think that it was those also uh, made us sensitive to is to ensure that there is not a digital divide, that we are aware that while many are benefit, benefiting for digital therapeutics, we have to recognize there are others that do not have access to those therapeutics. And breaching those needs is actually something that we should be uh, thinking of. Uh, in terms of medication treatments currently available, um, the low barrier buprenorphine has been showing now for many years to have very significant success and to be much more likely to, to sustain patients in treatment. I asked the question earlier on because I'm so very frustrated um, that despite the evidence, uh, the evidence is evidently not sufficient to actually change practices. And I specifically address it with respect to the very low uh, number of prescriptions for extended release formulations of buprenorphine and of naltrexone, which clearly have um, shown to be beneficial and to actually have the potential to show even greater benefit for severely, um, severely addicted patients with an opioid use disorder. And presumably also, as has been shown by already some clinical trials, to be valuable in helping individuals with uh, stimulant use disorder. As we think about the unique settings that we have and the opportunities that have actually been able to overcome some of the challenges that we're seeing amidst the COVID, clearly the emergency department, I would say, has been an extraordinary success. And it's been a success too, because it was, it's actually part of the healthcare system. So by the emergency department physicians being so actively engaged 
in the treatment of individuals with opioid use disorders, but also on educating and training others and uh, changing and coming up, coming up with guidelines. Um, they are modifying the way that the health healthcare system addresses substance use disorders. And I think this is an example about how embracing uh, by a, a, particular, a particular intervention uh, where you do show the benefits can ultimately change practices. We also heard about the unique challenges and the also opportunities by the diversity that cultures may bring into the treatment arena. And this is particularly uh, relevant as, as it relates, for example, with uh, in tribal regions where unfortunately the overdose mortality from methamphetamine is extremely high. And those interventions that are culturally sensitive uh, that target American Indian and Alaska natives for not just the treatment, I think that we need to also highlight the importance of prevention. And the final one is that of communities. And you heard really the remarkable work that is going on on the healing community studies. And it's remarkable, not just in the fact that it's taking evidence-based practices, but to me what it is remarkable is it has made it possible for communities that normally don't interact uh, with one another, with organizations that are very silo and they do their things on their own to actually integrate their efforts. And that integration of effort is likely to be what's going to create the largest impact, not just as, as it relates to the results of the study itself, but its impact long-term. I, I also, uh, by, by showing this integration of the communities, it is also evident how that is so extremely important in um, education and communication campaigns where the individuals themselves are directly involved. And that in turn is fundamental if we're going to be addressing the, one of the last subject themes that was discussed uh, in the last, in, at the end of the meeting, which is that of stigma. As we navigate the complexities of the addiction crisis that we're living, which now, as mentioned by others, is not just the opioid crisis, is an addiction crisis. We need to recognize that the stigma is interfered with our ability to contain it. And the stigma relates to the individuals that are suffering from the substance use disorder for the uh, treatments that we use for substance use disorders, for the organizations that are involved in the treatment or research of substance use disorders. Substance use disorders are highly stigmatized. And within the substance use disorders, there's also subgroups of stigmatization. And I end my presentation with it because I think that this is a task that we have an opportunity to get rid of. I think that the COVID pandemic has made us very aware about the disparities and inequities that exist among all of us. But it has also made us sensitive to the cost on suffering that that entails. And I think that even though the COVID pandemic has brought a lot of suffering and isolation, it has also made us much more aware and sensitive of the needs for others. And I do think that between that enhanced sensitivity of what is right and the value of science, that we, are, we will be able to uh, control this addiction crisis. And I would want to just end by thanking every one of you for your presentations, but very importantly, for your work in this area uh, that is so devastating. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Volkov. And thank you to all of our meeting attendees. Just a gentle reminder that um, when the meeting materials are available for sharing and posting on the website, you will get emailed a notice of that. And I also wanted to alert you that for those of you who would like to continue the conversation, there is an idea scale campaign that you can participate in. And I'm placing that in the chat right now. So again, thank you all for your participation and I wish you a good evening. Michelle, thanks very much. Thank you.